All right, so we left off last class um, kind of thinking about the labor market and we'll kind of talk about some additional issues here today. I actually might be a little bit short of a class to get you guys out of here a little early, but I wanted to mention a couple things, which is I've got that final kind of homework up there. That was one where I said, you know, I'm going to drop the lowest, but you know, if you, you've done the first five, you can just use it as a practice tool. Otherwise, you know, you can kind of make up for one that maybe, maybe you've missed or, you know, already. Um, so that's a kind of a nice opportunity there. Uh, if you've missed an assignment or didn't do too well, didn't get a lot of it done, you can kind of do this one. And then that, that would make the other, the old one, your lowest score in that one would get dropped. Right? So um, that's now up there. I need to move these kind of more recent eye clickers. And I think I have all the excused absences on these kind of eye clickers in the last month. So take a look. If you think for some reason I don't, um, send me an email so we can make sure that kind of everything's accounted for. But I think that I got everything up to date, at least up through kind of December. Right? Uh, I also put up, which I said I would, under final exam materials, I've got a set of practice problems. I've got another set of practice problems over the labor market that I'll probably put up before class on Monday. So it'll be some things in those practice problems that maybe we'll talk about next week, but at least we've got this week and um, I think that the, the Monday of, of, of Thanksgiving, all the stuff we've talked about the labor market, those questions will be in there as well. So some of them will look familiar, but some of them, right, we might not be covering until next week, okay? But you'll have two sets of practice problems to kind of get ready for the exam. I might be able to even get some uh, uh, additional ones up there um, before exam week, but but for now we'll kind of have those two sets of practice problems. Is the final going to be like? So <clears throat> it's. If I said this before, I feel like I've gotten asked this question, right? So it's just going to be from where we left off on the second exam. Now it's comprehensive in the sense of when we're talking about the labor market, we're thinking about like shifts in supply and demand. Um, but no, it'll be like the questions see will be specific to whatever the topics are that we've covered since the last exam. Yep. A little bit less content probably than the first two, um, but probably a little bit more difficult content, right? Since we're towards the end of the course. So um, I think that kind of helps, helps balance it out. A little bit less content than you have to know kind of you know, breadth wise, but a little bit you know, more more intense content. Any other questions for me before we kind of jump into things today? All right, so, oh, which one is this? There we are. So we've talked about the labor market. One thing that I want to mention, um, it'll seem like a side comment, like we won't really do a ton with it, but if you were to take like, a, you know, if you're an econ major or, or you're kind of picking up a minor, right? I think 301 is intermediate micro. We would dive a little bit more deeper into, into this relationship, probably between labor and capital. There's specifically like a labor econ course here as well, where you really dive into these issues. So I don't want to like really start to think about the trade-offs or choosing capital versus labor. Labor, but when I mean, you think about the market for capital, when we say capital, this is going to be anything that helps in the production process, right? Anything that helps us with increasing or decreasing output. So you know, labor is is one of the major components of, of producing anything. But if you're thinking about like factory production, right, you also have all this machinery. So that machinery is capital, right? You have to spend money on it, but it also produces your good, helps you produce your good. So just like with labor, right, we can think about there's going to be some demand for capital. Right? There's going to be some demand for machinery or computers or whatever it is, right? Whatever that material is, it's going to help you produce your product. Now you're willing to pay for that capital, whatever value it brings into the company. So here we've got to have the value of the marginal product of capital. So a lot of times the way we'll write this is very similar to how we did labor, right? When you think about that value on the marginal product for, sometimes we'll see it written as K. So for whatever reason, K is kind of what denotes capital, right? even though we spell it with a C. I, you know, don't ask me where that came from, but that, that is the convention that we kind of write it as. So really what we're thinking about there is you'll take the price of the product you sell, and instead of multiplying by the marginal product of labor, you'll be multiplying by the marginal product of capital, right? How many units does this capital help you increase, right? How many additional units are you able to produce times the value of those units, right? So it's a very similar idea to labor, 
just that what's kind of nice is with capital, we don't have to worry about this weird supply curve stuff where maybe it starts to like backward bend because people start making enough money where they're, they're okay working fewer hours. Capital doesn't have kind of those, those emotional feelings or that utility. So capital, we always kind of just expect to see this downward sloping demand curve and increasing supply curve, right? Because it's just, we purchase the, the most efficient or the, you know, um, we, sorry, we think about the marginal cost of capital, right? We're gonna take the, the capital that's the cheapest first and then kind of moving, you know, as, as we add more and more, we wanna produce more and more, we're gonna to have to start using less and less efficient capital. And so that supply curve is gonna be upward sloping, right? Every additional unit we wanna produce, we're gonna to have to eventually like switch, you know, we'll buy the, the most cost-effective machinery first, but there's a limit to what it can produce in a day. So if we need to add the next machine, well, maybe it wasn't quite as good, you know, but we kind of keep continuing to add in that capital, it's going to have an increasing cost because we're going to use the most efficient first and then kind of progress to the less and less efficient, similar to when we we're thinking about kind of, kind of workers. Okay. Excuse me. Um, so really just goes to kind of supply and demand, like anything when we want to determine the price, like we can determine what that price for, for capital would be, right? By where is the equilibrium point and that's just where our supply is equal to demand. So this is, is pretty, whoops, pretty easy, right? Um, very similar to the labor market, just, just slightly different terminology, right? So it's gonna operate the same way. The same economic principles that dictate the equilibrium wage would dictate the equilibrium kind of cost of capital or price for capital. Uh, any questions on that? Yeah. Yeah, so here it goes back to, um, we don't really have any like individuals involved in the sense that the demand is actually coming from the company still, just like demand for workers was coming from the companies. It's just now our supply is just coming from the, the availability of whatever machinery, whatever capital this is, right? So the workers actually here aren't involved at all. Um, it, it's just kind of a, like that's why I said, you know, the supply curve is a little more easy to understand because you know machines don't have feelings, right? They don't get content with a certain level of, of, uh, of wages. So here the demand is still coming from the companies. The companies are consuming capital just like they consume labor. Is that, can I get out where you're? Any other questions here? All right, so I'm gonna skip around because next week I wanna to try to keep the topics a little more consistent. So we'll talk a little bit more about wage inequality next week. I'm going to skip down here to thinking about why we might see equilibrium wages not be exactly equal to that workers' value of the marginal productivity of labor. So, just to refresh our, when we talked about last class with the labor market, kind of had wages up here. And what we said was, This equilibrium wage, right, the wage that the worker is getting paid should be exactly equal to, at this quantity of labor, exactly equal to their valuation of the marginal productivity of their labor, right? That wage should be exactly equal to whatever that value is or whatever that point is on that demand curve, right? Remember that the demand curve for labor was just, what's the, what's the value? Of the additional product that workers bring in, right? What's the additional revenue really that they're, they're generating? So why might we see workers paid something other than this wage? So we've got a couple different things. We'll talk about, we talked about minimum wage laws already. We went kind of through, through that last class. The two that we're gonna to cover today, I don't think we'll get to efficiency wages, but we'll talk about monopsony power and unions, okay? So unions in a labor market, think about what this is, okay? So when you form a union, the workers are coming together so that they have power, right? If you can get every single auto worker to be in your union, you essentially have a monopoly on the supply of workers, right? So monopolists, right? These companies had monopoly power in the product market. A union is gonna have monopoly power in the labor market. Right? Because the workers are supplying the labor, just like the companies were supplying the product. Okay. 
So if we think about what unions are going to do, it's going to operate very, very similar to what a monopolist would operate like in the, in the product market. So we'll think through this here. I've got my labor market. I've got some supply or sorry, some demand curve for labor and some supply curve for labor. Now, what's going to be true is just like the monopolist, if the workers come together and act as a union, well, remember, when a monopolist was supplying the product, now the union is supplying only the only supplier of labor. So they can dictate the price and they'll make a decision based off of a marginal revenue curve that's twice as steep as that demand curve for labor. That's what the monopolist did as well. So this is a good example where Exam is not comprehensive, right? A lot of these principles are building on each other, right? So the union here is going to make a decision, is going to, you know, they've got the only workers. If they all auto workers are, are in the union, if a company wants to have people to, to work their production line, they have to hire these union workers. So the union says, well, look, the optimal point for us is going to be where our marginal cost is equal to our marginal benefit or marginal revenue here. Now, think about marginal revenue here with the union, we probably think about like the marginal benefit to the union or the, the, everyone involved in the union. So they'll set the quantity of labor somewhere down here. And they know that at that quantity that the companies would be willing to pay for that last unit of labor, right? Or that last worker we know companies would be willing to pay whatever point we're at on the demand curve, right? Because companies would pay up to the value of that worker's marginal product of labor. So just like with a monopolist, right? We determine the quantity where that marginal cost equal to marginal benefit. It's just that, you know, instead of marginal revenues here, it may, it may not be revenues, right? It's kind of revenues for the union, but we might think about this as a marginal benefit instead. But marginal revenues before were our marginal benefit, so it's the same idea. We then go up to the demand curve and say, this is the equilibrium wage that as a monopolist, we can kind of set, right? Where unions acting as a monopolist, we're gonna get wages up here. Relative to the perfectly competitive point, let's say there was no union, well, it's just where supply is equal to demand. So we can see that relative to a free and open labor market, if it's unionized, we'll see higher wages, but fewer workers. Right? So a union on its face might seem really good, right? But you can imagine here that now results in some deadweight loss, right? Now the workers that keep their job and are in the union, they're much better off, right? They're going to get higher wages. So we, we it's kind of like with minimum wages. Whoever keeps their job, it's a good thing, right? However, with the union, there's going to be a certain number of people who are no longer employ, right? or at least that the company is no longer willing to employ. Because with these higher wages, every worker here has a value to the company that's below the wage. Well, if you're bringing in less than I have to pay you, you're actually detracting from my profits. Why would I hire you? So the union, unionization will increase wages, but cause some of these workers to no longer have a position. Any questions on, on this? So it operates very similar to what we're doing with monopolists. Um, unions result in higher wages and, and lower kind of number of workers. Now, you know, you, we could complicate this model. And really one of the main reasons why we see unions is because a lot of the times there are uh, externalities to society of, of maybe these workers being kind of facing these, uh, uh, you know, terrible work conditions or something like that. Or maybe it's simply that they need to unionize because there's only one employer. So this idea of only being one employer is monopsonist, right? So a monopsonist is kind of the, the flip of monopolist, right? So the monopolist was the only supplier of a good or our unions that were, they were like a monopolist because they were the only supplier of labor. A monopsonist is when you only have one consumer of a good or in this case, one consumer of labor. Now, the one consumer of a good, that's a lot harder to like find examples of. Um, maybe, uh, 
you know, like how would I have a monopsonist? Maybe something like, and now this isn't even the true, but go back 20 years, NASA was the only consumer of, you know, uh, what would be aero, aero, uh, aeronautical, whatever, whatever, right? Spaceships, right, right? So, I mean, that is a rare situation. We have a monopsonist in the, in the uh, product market. Maybe there's something where, you know, you've got one large company that's the only one consuming a specific input. Uh, I can't think of a great example of that off the top of my head. Maybe something like, uh, what's a good, you know, maybe if you had monopsony like in the 90s and you could consider that potentially Microsoft had some monopoly power. So maybe like they were the only consumer of certain types of computer hardware, but I don't even necessarily know if that, that would be kind of true because you, know, you did have small competing firms. But when it comes to the labor market, monopsonists or monopsony power is very evident, right? So we see it a lot. So like NASA would be the only employer of an astronaut, right? Uh, regional sports teams are the only employers of whatever that specific sport player is. Uh, small town, you gotta think about there could be regional monopsonists, right? If I'm living in a certain area, there may only be um, you know, one company that has any positions that, that, that I wanna work. So like, even if it was like a factory, right? There's only one factory in the town and there's nothing within a reasonable driving distance. That factory kind of has monopsony power over factory positions, right? Or you can think about it as the higher up you go. Um, if you want to say, let's say you wanted to, I don't know, be a politician, right? There's monopsony power in the sense that the only people that can employ you would be that state government that you live in, right? There's only one uh, you know, employer or one consumer of your labor if you want to be a politician. Right? So we see this pop up a lot. And so what's going to happen is we kind of have the, the results there, but I'll show you, walk you through visually what's going to happen with monopsony power. Okay? So it works exactly opposite of monopoly power or how a union would operate. So we've got our demand for labor, we've got our supply for labor. What's gonna end up happening is if I'm the only consumer of labor, right? I, as a company, I'm demanding labor, but I'm the only one who's demanding it, right? So maybe this is NASA, right? Thinking about how much they're gonna have to pay their astronauts. Well, I know that if they don't work for me, there's no one else they can work for, okay? So if they want to play, baseball, right? Or they want to play some sport in that area. There's only going to be one employer, right? There's only one, uh, <clears throat> well, or one, sometimes there's two, but, you know, if I want to play, say, football in, in Detroit, right? There's one, there's one, uh, I don't know why I'd want to do that, but there's one, right, consumer of my labor, okay? So what they're going to do is instead of having a twice as steep marginal revenue, the companies are the ones hiring the workers. So we're going to end up with a twice as steep and what we usually call it is the marginal expenditure, right? So we would have a twice as steep marginal expenditure curve, right? Coming off of our marginal cost or our supply curve. Right? And now everything's gonna work in reverse. So we look at this and say, okay, for the firm, their benefit is reflected in the demand curve. And if they're the only person, they can kind of set the equilibrium wage because they're the only employer, then this twice the steep marginal expenditure curve is gonna tell them kind of what their marginal cost is, so to say, right? Of setting this wage. So we'll find where that marginal expenditure curve hits my demand curve or my what represents the benefits to the company. They say, okay, this is the quantity of labor that monopsonist. This is the quantity of labor that we would set. And we know that at this quantity, workers would be willing to supply their labor for whatever value we're at on the supply curve, right? That would be, you know, we could offer at this quantity, if we offered this wage, every worker would be willing to work for that wage because the marginal cost of that worker would be less than that wage or that wage for them is the marginal benefit, right? For that worker, if I'm getting paid this and the marginal cost of supplying that labor is way down here, I'm net positive. So they know at this quantity, they can set 
this lower wage. So this is our monopsonist. Okay. So what is, you know, if we compare that to the perfectly competitive outcome where supply is equal to demand, right? We can see that with a monopsonist, we get a lower wage and a lower number of workers. And that kind of makes sense. If I have entire control of, you know, I'm the only one that can hire you, you, you don't have as much power as a worker, right? You're gonna, you know, if I wanna offer you a lower wage and you really wanna do that job, you either have to work for that wage or you don't get to do that job, right? If I wanna be an astronaut, I have to just accept whatever NASA's salary is. Otherwise I can't go to space and be an astronaut. At least that makes a little more sense 20 years ago now, you know, Elon Musk is trying to, to ruin my example for this, but um, you know, that, that's the idea, right? I have a lot less power as a worker. And so if I have a situation here, fewer people are gonna be employed and workers are gonna get less wages. Even those who are keeping their job are making less money. So if we have an industry where we only have one employer, a good example of this was like Detroit, right? Your main employer was just like Ford Motor Company, right? And if I wanted to get a decent paying job, you know, out of high school or, you know, whatever it is with my skill set, I had to work for Ford Motor Company. So because there was that monopsonist power, right, wages are relatively low. Well, eventually the workers realize that we have to combat this, right? Like we, we don't really have any, like we can't make a credible threat. If we tell them I'm not going to work unless you give me a higher wage, they're going to say, okay, we can find someone else. You know, there, there's, there's other people that would want to work. You either have to accept this wage because we know that even though you're threatening to leave, there's no other job you can go out and find where you can make this much money in the auto industry, right? And so the only way that you maybe can combat monopsony power where wages are lower, I can pick this piece of paper up, is unionizing to get your own power in the market where you can then kind of help try to get higher wages for those people who are kind of working or who are uh, in the industry, okay? Um, I'll try to draw what, I probably wouldn't do this to you on the exam. I would kind of only expect you to understand kind of one of those things occurring at the same time. But I think it's valuable in understanding how this union combats the monop monopsonist power. So we've got our supply and demand curves. We said with monopsonist power, they make decisions based off of this marginal expenditure curve. They set this quantity and they know that workers be willing to pay or uh, work for this lower wage. So we'll call this W W M O N, right? Then for the union, they made decisions based off of this twice as steep kind of marginal benefit or marginal revenue curve, right? Where did that hit supply? And they know at that point, Companies be willing to pay this higher wage. So here's my union's wage. So what essentially happens is the union says, well, look, yeah, there might be fewer workers. If we go back to just the impact of a union, the effect was that there was fewer workers, but higher wages, right? Fewer workers, but higher wages. Well, the whole reason why the union doesn't look at that loss of the number of workers as, as a bad thing is they know that if they're trying to combat monopsony power, that's already driving, that's gonna be eliminating those positions anyways. So those positions, if the union didn't exist, right, that monopsonist would have been hiring fewer per, uh, workers than the perfectly competitive point anyways. So then the union says, okay, so those jobs are gonna be lost either way, at least if we get some monopoly power, or you know, unionize and get some monopoly power, at least now we know that we can credibly threaten this company because if they want workers, right? If we're the only work, every auto worker is now in the union, they're going to have to hire union workers and we're going to have a little more power. And so what you say, see play out is both these sides, right? They've got different optimal wages. They like to set, they have to kind of bargain back and forth. Right. And that's why sometimes you get strikes or, you know, sometimes you get lockouts in, in sports where, where the, the uh, uh, teams say we're not going to play the games until the, the union cooperates. That's why you see in different unionized industries, you see labor strikes because they say, look, if you're not gonna give us these higher wages, you don't wanna try to pay us these, these wages because you've got monopsony power, 
we're not going to play ball. We're, none of us are going to work. The teachers unions is, that is another good example. Um, now, so, so unions can be a good thing, right? Unions can be good if they are combating monopsonist power. However, if there's no monopsonist power, right, unions still result in deadweight loss, right? It's just that when we had monopsonist power, that deadweight loss is going to exist already. And so at least the union can help kind of get wages, you know, bargain for wages somewhere in this range, as opposed to as low as the monopsonist would like to, to pay them. Any questions on anything there? Okay with this. All right, so um, I left this, oops, I left this slide open to kind of people printing them out to, to write on, but um, you know, really the result is that we see lower wages from a monopsony and a, a lower number of workers, right? And the way we can combat that was the union, which we just kind of said helped increase the wages. For workers. So, you know, if you don't have monopsony power, like I, uh, unions aren't probably the greatest idea, right? Because they're just going to cost, cost jobs. But if there is some monopsonist power, you can help combat, there's going to be the job loss anyways, at least now you're getting your workers a little bit higher wages or better working conditions, right? I'm using wages, but wages really could be like the total value of the job, right? The wages plus benefits plus, you know, the working conditions, you know, so, um, I don't know, pretty relevant. You know, we see unions in a lot of different industries and, and we really have to ask ourselves, are they actually you know, combating monopsony power or are they just you know, it, causing dead weight loss in, in, in whatever labor market that is? Any other questions here? All right, so I really wanna save this so I can do this all together. Um, I'll show you a couple of them. We'll just lead it into to what we'll do on Monday. So, you know, we're talking about reasons why wages might not line up with um, the, the workers' value of their marginal productivity of labor. So what are some other factors? Like, what, do, what does wage inequality look like? Well, I mean, you hear a lot like the top 1% or top, you know, whatever, you know, 0.1% own a lot of the wealth. So right at the top 1%, at least, uh, I think this goes to 2020, we're, we're floating around like, 40%, maybe as low as 30 in some years, but the top 1% owns like 30% of the wealth in America. Right? That's, that seems pretty imba imbalanced, right? Um, we can look at other measures, right? Of how, or we can look at different measures of how do we capture this type of, of economic inequality, right? So we'll talk about some different measures of economic inequality and we'll kind of simplify the models a little bit, but I think that I'll uh, hold off on this until until Monday. So we'll go through all of this Lorenz curve, Gini coefficients. We'll talk about some human capital and skill-based changes. Um, but I think today I might uh, might let us out let us out early because we're kind of in a good place. Right? So next week we'll talk about this wage inequality. Uh, I'll probably bring in I'll throw it I'll re redo these slides to only cover what we, we went through this week take some of the, the stuff that was in here, put it in a new file, and I'll probably throw some, some additional stuff in there. We might be able to look at some uh, like gender discrimination and things like that next week as well, okay? All right, so if there's no more questions for me. I'll let you guys get out of here a little early. Enjoy your weekend, be safe, and I will see you on Monday. Actually, wait, before everybody leaves,